Um, so uh, my name is Ben Sigurdsson. I am the uh, literary editor and drinks writer for the Winnipeg Free Press, and welcome to the Icelandic Festival of Manitoba's virtual event, The Mystery of Writing with Ursa Sigurdor Daughter. Over the course of the last 15 years, Ursa has established herself as one of Iceland's preeminent crime writers through the Thora Goodman's Daughter series, the Freya and Holdar Children's House series, as well as uh, standalone novels. Uh, her latest thriller to be translated into English is Gallows Rock, the fourth book of the uh, the Children's House series, which will be available at your favorite bookstores by the time you watch this. I don't think it's quite out yet but when we're recording it, but uh, in addition to her thrillers, Ursa has write, written some books for children and has played a, uh, a vital role in the evolution of thriller writing and literary culture in Iceland, a country where books and writers hold a valued and uh, cherished place in daily life. And uh, with that, from her home, I believe, your home in Iceland? I am, yes I am. Uh, here's Irsa. So thanks so much for, uh, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, these kind of virtual events seem to become the, uh, seem to be the norm now. And, uh, you know, I imagine in other circumstances, you know, you're, with your book just coming, your fourth book just coming out in, uh, of the Children's House series coming out in English, you might actually be here or doing some touring for it. Um, how have you been finding working as an author doing these kind of things during the, uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic? And, and, and I guess the sort of a subsequent or second question to that is like writing wise, have you found that, uh, have you found yourself to be more or less active in the writing process during this time? Yeah, it's um, with regards to the latter half about being more or less uh, um what was the word you used? I'm sorry. No, my, my English will get better as, as we speak. No, it's fine. Like the, the writing process, I guess. So, you know, right. if you, more right. prolific, less prolific, more writing, less writing. Yeah, less writing, which is really odd because uh, usually I travel very extensively. I make at least usually two to three trips a month abroad for, mm -hmm. for promotion and things. And I thought, you know, when this hit, I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll use the time wisely. And I'll, I'll be, you know, way ahead of my deadline. And, and it turned out it, it was just not inspiring and, and somehow depressing in a way. So, so I didn't no, I was I was worse at writing during, yeah. during the lockdown or lock. There was no really lockdown, but we, we stayed a lot at home. And, and because I, I think part of at least part of what sort of inspires me as a writer is, is interaction with people. And I, and I usually meet a lot of people. I'm still working a little bit as an engineer and staying at home is, is somehow, it was just such an odd time that it didn't, didn't help me with my writing at all. No. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so generally speaking, do you find you're a fairly, a fairly quick writer? Like I, I, you, you sort of seem to have a book come out, um, you know, almost, almost one a year, which I, we can talk a little bit more about that uh, later, but are generally speaking, you know, are you, are you a fairly quick writer? Are you fairly, you know, do you, a lot of revising, editing as you go, or do you just sort of leave that until closer to the end of a book? Yeah, I'm I'm fairly quick, and that's only because I'm I'm also a little bit lazy. <laughs> so I, I tend to to do the bulk of the writing towards the closer I get to my deadline, the more the more uh, hardworking I am. I, mm -hmm. guess. I know that I feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I do the editing as I go along. So, so my editor gets like every chapter, once I finish it, he gets the chapter without knowing how it's going to end or anything. And so, so by the time I write the end or finish the book, there is very little to be done. So usually, I mean, the, the publishing industry in Iceland is very different from, from larger countries such as Canada. But from the time I send him the final chapter, it's under a month before it's in the bookshops. Oh, wow. Um, and, and so one thing I guess I was going to touch on a little bit later, um, in terms of the literary culture uh, in Iceland, um, is your publishing schedule or your, your sort of routine, uh, is it shaped at all by the, the Yola Book of Flood, the Christmas Book Flood? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. So maybe for those who aren't, who, who aren't as familiar with, with uh, that phenomenon, can you sort of explain a little bit about, about that? It's, it's uh, an Icelandic... Uh a tradition in a way to give books for as a Christmas present and the idea is that you you get the, the book on, on Christmas Eve and then you spend the cold you know snowy uh, evenings and days during the Christmas holiday reading 
And then there are lots of like family uh, get togethers. And then people will be talking about like, what book did you get or what books did you get? And people will be discussing the books they got and, 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 and literature, which is really, really nice. Mm-hmm. And, but because we're such a small country, it's, it doesn't make any sense really for publishers to publish hardback novels by local authors except for that one period a year. So all of the books that come out in hardcover, there are some that come out in paperback, obviously, during during the year. But all of the the novels by by uh, local authors come out for this Christmas book flood or Yola book uploaded. Mm-hmm. And so that would sort of help. It probably helps you sort of retroactively or look back at the, you know, look at your schedule and go, okay, well, I need to be done by this time so that my book is included in the Yellow Book of Food. Yeah, exactly. That's why deadlines are very, very important to you because if you miss the, the, the Christmas book flood, then, then uh, that means you're, you're late by a year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Late by a year, yeah. Gotcha. Um, okay, well, let's let's back up a little bit. So, tell me a little bit about um, your starting out as a writer. You said you're, you you trained as a civil engineer. Um, yes. What made you d- uh, sort of dive into to writing fiction? And and you know, who were some of your literary influences? Well, I, st- I started off uh, writing for children, and and I was uh, the reason I did it was um, I, I I myself. I know I would say my introduction into being a writer is love of reading. I've always been a fanatical reader since I was a kid. And, and I was a little bit worried about my son because he wasn't, didn't show any interest in reading. And he was I think, eight or nine at the time. And, and then I, I was looking at the books that were at the time in fashion or available for kids. And they were kind of grim, you know, teaching children a lesson and, and things. And I thought, you know, he's not going to, He's not going to fall in love with reading. You know, it seemed kind of more advanced than, than I thought he would, he would like. So, so I started off by writing children's books that were more um, entertainment, you know, kids in, in, in various comic situations. And, and I did that for five years. So I wrote five books in a row. And, and, and then it was because it was humor. I was just, I don't know, tired of being funny. And I thought I, I had quit writing for good. And then I took a two year, just I stopped. And, and then I got the urge again and I was contacted and asked if I would like to try my hand at um, crime fiction, which, uh, which I had suggested that I might try to my publisher at the time when I was writing the children's books. But then nobody wanted to publish Icelandic uh, crime fiction novels because the belief was that the Icelandic public wouldn't want to read uh, about murder in Iceland because it was so, they would find it so incredible and unbelievable. And, but uh, so, so by that time, uh, they had, Artantur Intrauson had sort of shown shown the nation that this can be done and, 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 and it's not incredible or any more incredible than, than, than murder mystery set elsewhere. So, and it was very, very, um, to me, an easy choice to make that I would write crime because that's really what, my favorite is to read crime and horror. So, hmm. and so, did you have any sort of favorite writers coming into the the crime writing process that you sort of looked at? Yeah, I did. I mean, I I, I quite uh, you know, there were many. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up reading, of course, as a kid or a twelve, thirteen year old. I, I, my my father introduced me to Agatha Christie. I, I very much uh, have very much respect for for her books. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, the, the later, you know, much more recent authors. But this is like 15 years ago. So I, I, I like P.D. James, Jonathan Kellerman. Uh, I mean, basically just a lot, a lot of authors. And today I, I kind of prefer the, the Scandinavian crime writers that are writing now. So, but I think I've read everybody. And then I also, I mean, it's just such a such a, a lively genre that there are so many so many good authors out there so many different takes on the on the, the story and um and in a way i also appreciate that most of them are writing out of their own home country so you also get a little bit of an insight into into um yeah different places mm-hmm. and what what is it do you think what do you think it is about about iceland that has fostered such a 
a culture of noir and crime fiction? Is it is it sort of the opposite side of the coin? Is it that, that there that there is so little crime and and you know and, and murders and and what have you in in the country? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think I think that both Icelandic people are not different from any other people. That that crime fiction is interesting. It's like uh, and, 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 for example, Unsolved Mystery Podcast, all of this, this is interesting to people because I think our, our DNA wants us always to we want to understand things, we want to see how they work, and, and that sort of translates into wanting to know the solution of the riddle, if, if you may. I mean, that's not enough to have a good riddle in a, in a crime novel. But, but I think also because we're so peaceful and there are very few murders committed here, uh, I think that makes it... Um, Probably more popular in a in a way because they, I would imagine that people that live in a in a um, really crime ridden neighborhood or or where murder is rampant uh, or people that live under civil war, I think when they read for pleasure they would choose something else than than murder and mayhem. Yeah, more more escapist sort of to yeah. to, to get their mind off of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and. Uh, when you, okay, you were talking about a, like sort of riddles, like, I mean, when you start one of your books, do you, like your thriller books, do you, do you know sort of what the, where the ending is going, what's happening? Or do you, do you, are you, do different books sort of pull you into an idea sort of at different places when you're starting to write them? No, usually I, I know where I'm headed from, from the get go. Uh, I, I don't think in any book I have completely changed the, the sort of, where the book is or how the book is going to end. Mm -hmm. but, but I do, during the writing process, I do take a look, stop. I usually always stop after 10 chapters, read them through and try to read them like a reader, like they're not my my uh, words. And and then I, I kind of see, you know, if, if it's something is missing, be it pacing, be it uh, just, you know, how interesting is this to read? What would I think if I was a reader? and and. The, during that period, I sometimes like add more meat to the bone, I guess. Mm -hmm. And how so exactly the way where I'm going from the beginning to the end, but I do know where I'm headed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I would I would imagine that a lot of, a lot of times along the way you encounter something that is quite surprising that that you didn't really anticipate sort of coming into the storyline. Yes, but not exactly when while I'm writing. It's not like I, I don't know. I've heard. Writers say that sometimes their characters surprise them. That that doesn't happen to me because I mean these are my characters. They're in my head. You know, I don't know how the hell they would be able to surprise me because I would see them coming. Yeah. But I, there are some times where I think um, of, of some some sort of ad addition to the story that that I did not know I would have in the beginning. Hmm. And so. I guess, um, relatively speaking, between the the Freya and Holder books and the the Thor books, um, you know, is is there? How do you find? How did you find sort of writing one series versus the other? Like, was there a dynamic between Freya, Freya and Holder that sort of allows you a little bit more flexibility in terms of, you know, sort of extrapolating or dialogue between them to sort of help sort of move the story along? Yeah, usually. The, the biggest difference, I think, between these two series for me as a writer, really, was that Thora was a lawyer. So, so I, not only did I have to come up with, and they were not court, courtroom dramas. Mm -hmm. So I had to find a way of having an interesting uh, murder or, 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 or crime, and also a way of injecting the lawyer into the case. Because usually here in Iceland, lawyers, their, their biggest part in, in, in any sort of crime would be towards the end when it comes to trial. And I didn't want to write a, a, a courtroom mystery. So, so that added sort of a, a complex layer to it. And, and, and so when I wrote the, the second series, um, it, was, it was kind of a little bit easier to have a policeman because a policeman can um, get witnesses to talk. I mean, they, they, have, they have access to all of the... Uh, crime scene, the, the, you know, the stuff that's left behind and so on. So, mm -hmm. so it, it was a bit easier, but I didn't, also I didn't want to write just a 
least procedural. So, so I added uh, Freya, who is a child psychologist, to, to keep it more to type of thing that I, I like to read. Because like most authors, I try to write a book that I would like to read. Mm-hmm. Oh. And, and is, is there a fair bit of um, research that uh, there must be a fair bit of research that goes into, you know, learning how police procedure works learn, and, and, you know, the, the world of, of psychologists as, as well, I would think. Yeah, there is. There, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of information available um, online, but, but, the, but it's also always good to, to talk to, to actual people and, and visit places. And I never, I don't like writing about, for example, places that I've not been to. You have to see it in 3D, you know, get all the senses working, not just photos or Google Maps. Uh, and the same applies to, to, uh, to, to police work and, and so on. But, but, but with Thaura, the, the lawyer, I had a friend who was a lawyer who helped me with that. Um, and for the more complex legal issues, I, I sometimes would buy like a legal brief from a law office. And, uh, but a lot of the law is online. You can read the law and, and follow through like what applies to what. But, mm-hmm. but it's, uh, yeah, but it's, the research is fun. It's really fun. Mm-hmm. And how much how much of your time do you spend? You said it takes you about a month. You said to 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 write a book, and how is that right? Oh, no, not a month. No, no, it's more. It's more. Okay, okay. I, I'm I'm for, I'm remembering something from earlier that you said. But anyway, so um, you do like you do you spend a fair like is that a lot of your time spent researching? It, it is, but it's it's not. I mean, the bulk of the bulk of the work is is uh, writing the actual book. Um, mm-hmm. There is a lot of thinking that you have to do, the research. It kind of depends. I mean, I've, I've written so many crime novels. I know a lot already now, more than I really want to, about the composition of bodies and, and, and you know, very, very many things that, yeah, I would prefer not to know. But uh, so, so some of that I don't have to, to re-research every time. But, uh, but the research is, is good, and it's also good to... to um, so sort of get the creative juices flowing. So I try to do the research when I, I'm still, I don't, the idea is not fully formed still in my head because sometimes things come out of the research that kind of change the way I, I, I want the book to. Sure. Go. Um, and um, I know there are probably some, some, some aspiring writers who will end up watching this. Um, do you have any sort of advice that you would give to someone who is having trouble starting their own story or, you know, ways to sort of keep, keep the motivation going? It's, it's really hard for, for, for someone who's writing their first novel to, to keep going because for, for very few new authors, myself included, when I was starting out, no one is waiting for this book. So, so you don't have the added pressure of somebody pushing you to continue. So, so, so I would, my, my, um, my suggestion would be to finish it, you know, put the pressure on yourself and, and try sort of, like I said before, reading it as a reader and not to worry if you don't like it, you know, you can always go back and fix things, but don't stall on a, on a, on a, on a sentence that, that, that you find is not good. And then your, your, uh, self-esteem you know, falls to the floor. This happens to every writer that, that we don't like what we're doing. And, and the best thing is just leave it and come back to it. Mm. Um, and also, and- also maybe another suggestion would be for someone who doesn't know how to start the story that they, they, they're about to write, would be to, to maybe take, you know, gather together some of your favorite books, read them with the eyes of, the craft, you know, not just the entertainment, but to see just how do how do authors do this? How do they introduce you to a place? How do they sort of you know work with the atmosphere and and, and not copy it, but just to get a feel of, of what is required to get the reader's mind sort of into into their mm-hmm. spot, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So okay, so your 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 fourth children's house book is coming out. Well, by the time people have watched this, it will be out in English. Um, and you've, you, your fifth book is already out uh, in Icelandic and will presumably be coming, uh, you know, soon in the regular cycle of things in English. Um, and then so you're six. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, and so what 
are you what are, what are you sort of working on now? What's uh, what's next for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm at present. I'm writing a, a standalone sort of horrorish novel. Mm. Uh, I finished the children's house series. I decided in the beginning it would be maximum six, and I'm sticking to that, even though I wasn't tired of them yet. And I think it's mm. better to quit while you're ahead. And I I tend to. I wrote five children's novels, six in the photo series, six in the, the, the children's uh, house series. And I think that's fine for me. There are authors that can continue, and that's great. But for me, I get a little bit tired, and I want to do something else. So, so, so I'm writing a standalone at present. Okay. And it's good, it's good to, to jump around. And I'm also writing a children's book, actually. Oh, you are? Okay. Because I was going to say, in doing some research, it seems like it's been quite a while since you've, you've written a children's book. Yeah. So this and, is and, fun. It's really fun to, to write. Oh, that's good. Um, and are, are you able to work on simultaneous, pro, like two, two, more than one project at once? Yeah, I am. I am because it's, well, I, I've never done it before, but this is my first time. But, but the, the reason I can do it is because it's so different. There's no way that I would ever be writing the, the children's book and take somehow the atmosphere from that into the horror novel. Because the children's book is humor and the, the horror novel is absolutely not funny at all. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there's no way that they will leak into each other. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's my and, and do you find sort of when, yeah, when you get stalled out on one, you can jump over to the other one? Or you just or you're, you're sort of feeling inspired one day to sort of write more of the horror stuff or... Vice versa. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, geez, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Uh, is there anything else you you wanted to talk about before we wrap up? Or maybe I just wanted to mention because it's for the Eastern Dikataurin, and, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to mention that I, I I came to Canada in 2008 for a book tour, and I went to see the museum. Yeah, the Icelandic Museum. I'm not sure the name of the museum, actually, but it's about the Icelandic settlers. Mm -hmm. It was so touching uh, somehow. And, and, and I remember a story they told me that, that there was a young woman coming, emigrating, and she had her baby with her, and the baby died on board. And so the captain was going to do us uh, like a, a, a service service at sea and, and the woman had wrapped her baby in, in a ta like an embroidered tablecloth she had brought with her and the captain did the service and then he took the baby it was going to throw it into the sea but he took off the tablecloth so this is too good to throw into the ocean and, and threw the baby without the tablecloth and it's just I don't know it's, it's, uh, it's not that long a time since this happened mm -hmm. how much things have changed somehow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another another um, thing is I heard on the radio a few years ago, there was an interview or like a, a program about an Icelandic captain here that had, as a child, been uh, when he was eight, I think, he was sent to Canada because there was so much poverty and hardship. And, and, and he was sailed to New York and someone was going to pick him up and, and he was going to go work in Canada and with, with the Icelandic settlers. And he didn't know any English, anything, and he goes on the ship, and then for some reason he wasn't picked up. So he had to somehow find a way to get to Canada, eight years old. And then when I was listening to this on the radio, my grandson was eight, and he was not, his parents didn't trust him to take a bus from Keflavik to Reykjavik alone, which mm -hmm. is like a 40 minute drive, and there's no stops on the way. Yeah. <laughs> so it shows that how, how, you know, even though there are many things that we find, could be better today how much improvement there has been in Iceland when it comes to the, the just yeah the standard of living and, and yeah mm -hmm. the tough mm -hmm. well hopefully uh, you're able to make it back here at some point uh, once things I don't know return to normal or become the new normal or whatever and yeah, uh, yeah it would be great to uh, to hear you read from your your latest book and uh, and yeah, maybe chat in person next time. So that would be that would be fantastic. And also, my daughter is born in Canada. So oh, really? So I, my daughter is Canadian Icelandic as well. Okay. So, as opposed so, to mo most of us here who are Icelandic Canadian. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, whereabouts was she born? In Montreal. Oh, nice. Gotcha. Well, um, yeah. Sorry. So I, I I take every opportunity I can to go to Canada. I love. Good. Canada. 
Well, I, I, I hope that uh, you do have that opportunity again soon and that, uh, you know, if you are do, on, on a book tour that, uh, you know, Winnipeg uh, or, or Manitoba in general can be uh, on, the, on the list. And uh, yeah, it, if not for, uh, for uh, the, you know, the next uh, translations of the children's house books, then maybe for your horror book or your children's book, whenever they're done. So I guess it all depends on when things open up again. Anyway, yeah. I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk with me today, Ursa. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope uh, you know everyone had uh, got some some interesting uh, tidbits and and you know little bits and pieces about Ursa, Ursa's writing and about the writing life and life in Iceland in general. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks very much for watching. And thank you, Ursa, again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You bet.